Hi, Masa. Uh, hi. Uh, how are you? <laughs> yeah, great. Nice to to be able to catch you. And first of all, thanks so much for making the time. And uh, yeah, we've been uh, talking a few times already. But every time I try to catch you uh, when you have a bit of Wi-Fi somewhere and uh, along your travel. So thanks so much for making the time and to share a little bit of your experience, not only with me but only also with um, with fellow um, other women today. Sure, my, my pleasure. I'm sorry if it's been so complicated. Uh, you see, we have kind of like lightning here. <laughs> yeah, so, so for, for those who, who don't know, so Masa is, uh, is in a hotel at the moment in a corridor and trying to catch some Wi-Fi to, to talk with me. But yeah, we'll get to know a bit more about that uh, in a minute. So just as an introduction, um, so Masa has been a lifelong traveler, basically. She started traveling when she was 16. Um, and but motorcycle only came into the picture in 2015, and it started actually in Southeast Asia where I'm based. So um, she started renting small two wheelers. Uh, that's quite easy to do in Southeast Asia, and that's how she started to be into motorcycles. And in 2011, um, she took the plunge and decided to have a bigger bike to travel to West Africa. So quite a challenging area to travel with. But uh, the interesting fact is that she took her husband on the back of a bike. So we'll hear a bit more about that later. Uh, she's also been riding solo uh, across more than 60 countries over the years. Uh, but I think what's very uh, interesting with Masa is that traveling is not really, has never been as set in a particular time frame. It's more lifestyle. So um, she's basically leaves while she travels. And um, how does she make money? How does she make a living? Well, nine years ago, she founded a travel company called Not Just a Tourist in Seville, in Spain, um, to give fellow travelers an authentic experience of southern Spain and give them access to local people. So it's a way to be invited into the country as a close friend and not just as a tourist, basically. Um, so from her personal encounters and travel, she indeed realized the importance of travel for both locals and visitors alike. And that's why she wants to facilitate those interactions for a more meaningful and inspiring tourism. That's also the reason why uh, she didn't give a second thought when I contacted her and uh, as a fellow uh, woman um, motorcyclist um, to help me develop a free W tour for women in Iran, where she's originally from. And of course, that totally fits her traveling philosophy. And she's very keen to have women experience Iran, her, her Iran. So yeah, so Massa, first of all, uh, tell us a bit more where you are now. What are your travel plans at the moment? And mostly, like, what are your challenges? Because traveling during uh, the pandemic is, uh, is quite tricky. So tell us a bit more where you are now. Well, right now, right now, I'm actually standing in the corridor of my hotel room. <laughs> so, because um, I, as you mentioned, you know, I'm always on the road and always struggling with the Wi-Fi. Um, but um, this is not exactly the nicest place I want to be with the lights, you know, with the sensor going on and off. But I'm actually um, riding my uh, newly purchased bike uh, in Bulgaria because, um, you know, we all know Corona is not a secret anymore. So when it happened, um, it surprised me in Africa and I stayed there for some time. And then I flew back um, after about like four months um, to uh, Europe, but my bike is still in Africa. So I had to buy a new bike, which I also managed to do and, you know, adjust it and all these things. And I hit the road again because for me, it's kind of like difficult to stay in a place because I feel that I'm losing the energy and I can learn much more and get much more done on the road. So, um, and Bulgaria has been a very pleasant surprise to me. I don't know what you know or what, you know, most people know about Bulgaria. I didn't know anything when I came here, nothing, like absolutely nothing. And it uh, has proved to be a beautiful country, nice climate, great food, very helpful uh, people, and very nice uh, biker community. 
Okay, okay, yeah, I didn't know that because I actually know Bulgaria from work. Like in my previous job, the headquarters of my company was in Bulgaria. So I went a few times to Sofia, but mostly in the cold weather and I hated uh. it. <laughs> and I love the city, but I didn't get to ride my bike there or to travel yeah. more like outside Sofia. So yeah, yeah, it's good to know. So what are the biggest challenges? So we, earlier when we connected here, yeah, you told me Wi-Fi is definitely the biggest challenge because even in developed countries, you don't really have always uh, very nice connections, but are there any particular specific challenges that you face at the moment traveling around? Um, as you mentioned, I think uh, probably Wi-Fi is the first and foremost problem, <laughs> which is crazy. Um, other than that, usually if you are a long-term traveler, obviously, you know, sometimes you might feel tired and lonely, you know, just like tired because everything is on you and you have to get so many things done and lonely because, you know, again, or, you know, to share a nice moment or to help you with the problem, all these things. But I haven't had those problems here, uh, fortunately, so far. So that's why you see the widest smile on my face. Um, I think the biggest challenge um, on this particular trip, I'm now one month into my trip, um, is basically uh, more or less like I mean when I started it was uh, corona and all the restrictions and more than the restrictions the confusion because I was in Austria I had to cross a few countries I was going to spend some time in each country and um, you actually I mean it's crazy but there is no place that you can find a valid and updated information like like you know i was going to pass through serbia and i read on their website and you know on many different websites like official websites for example from germany about you know serbia and all these things uh foreign ministry of germany that you cannot travel you need a test that you know the borders are closed and at some point i said you know i'm just gonna get going i'm just gonna go to the border and if it's open i cross if not you know i take another border i go to another country it's a matter of 300 kilometers more or less and they proved to be mostly open. So nobody even asked me if, you know, where I'm coming from, where I was, or, you know, no Corona test. So it was like very confusing to me because, you know, they make it so difficult as if, you know, the borders are closed. And so far I have crossed uh, um, Serbia, Romania, Hungary, Austria, and Bulgaria. No problem at all. I wasn't even asked. So that was a good surprise. Surprise Actually, for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it so, was just the uncertainty of starting, but once you are, you know, on the road, it was all great. Yeah, yeah, I understand. And so, what's the next country? Like, uh, are you planning to stay for one in Bulgaria, or, or are you moving to another one soon? Um, I, I usually don't have like I have maybe some vague plan. Um, so my vague plan um, is sending me to Greece. <laughs> Uh, because also, you know, the winter That's is bad, coming. Warmer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I thought um, that's a nice place to stay there. And there are so many islands, beautiful um, nature. And because, you know, there is not much tourism. So hopefully the prices are uh, less expensive. You know, I have like more things for myself. But I'm not sure because... Um, I think they do ask for a corona test if you come from Bulgaria and uh, for me, and they only accept it from certain licensed lab and those labs are in certain cities and I'm not coming from those cities and you know also a test costs money and it's only valid like maybe for one country entry so it's kind of like money that you threw away and you know the results can be wrong so you can really get yourself into trouble if you are a false positive which has happened to people so I have to see because uh, my bike is in Sudan and the border between Sudan and Egypt, my other bike is open. So I might just take a flight and go to Sudan and, you know, um, carry on the trip. But then I would not be able to go anywhere after Egypt because also the borders are closed again and there are no ferries and, you know, yeah. all these things. So, yeah. yeah. Or I might go to Turkey. It seems to be like the, the paradise now for bikers because... Um, because the prices are very down, because the currency is not so uh, strong right now. Um, they don't have any restrictions, so anybody can enter. And it's a nice country, great food, nice scenery. So, you know, I have some options. <laughs> nice, nice, yeah, a lot of options in front of you. So, but tell me, like, uh, what, 
what um, made you start? Uh, what made you choose this lifestyle? Like, because uh, how long have, have you been out without a fixed home? Yeah, years now. Yes, I started like living a life of a digital nomad, like in 2013. But I gave up my um, apartment in uh, Seville in 2017, I think. So yeah, it's been like about three years that I have like no, you know, no plants to water. <laughs> and so, so what made you choose this lifestyle, taking basically this being plunged and knowing that you don't have like a fixed home anymore? And do you see yourself at some point in, in a few years settling down somewhere? Oh, no. I think it was just like a process, you know, like you start doing something and then you see if you like it or not. And then, you know, you meet other people who are doing the same thing. I mean, actually, I didn't meet anybody who was doing exactly the same thing as I was doing. Um, I think like being a digital nomad and riding a motorbike, it's kind of like very difficult. Um, but... Uh, I mean, it's like, I think basically our desire, we all have this desire to be free, to have time, to, uh, to be able to travel, to be the owner of our time, right? Um, so that was this desire that, you know, made me find the way to be able to travel and uh, have an income. Um, so, and if I'm going to, like, and for me, just a step, like, to give up my apartment is kind of, like, hard emotionally, um, you know? Um, as you said, it's just like, uh, it's the base you have, it's the roots you have, you know, it's like the shelter, maybe you want to go back to, but I found out that it was just like a lot of work and worry to uh, keep it there, to look always for some, somebody, you know, to rent it out. Uh, I had plans, I have beautiful Persian carpets, so, you know, I had to make sure that nobody, like, that people take off their shoes when they enter the, <laughs> the apartment, even if I haven't been there for three or four years, so it was kind of like, <laughs> and, you know, I was always asking people who were living there, how are the plants, you know, it was just like, okay. Uh, so I kind of, like, gave up everything in 2017. I was going to buy a van and put my bike and kind of, like, leave, you know, in a van with my bike, but while I was doing the research, I found out that also, you know, driving a car in a, like a rod, it's not for me. Like I really prefer um, the hardship, the minimalism of the motorbike than like the comfort and also the problems of maneuvering a big car, you know, uh, especially in Europe or in city. Um, if I'm going to settle down, well, I don't know. We, you know, we, we never know how we're going to change where life takes us. But uh, I'm 44 now, and I've never had that desire to settle down. I think uh, world is a beautiful place, and it's inviting. So, I mean, settling down doesn't have the same meaning to me that it might have to other people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. Uh, that's the ultimate uh, freedom. And uh, yeah, you just take it as it is, and you'll see if your circumstance changes at some point, then you make different decisions, right? And um, so you mentioned you have two bikes at the moment. So uh, one that you bought here in Europe and one that is uh, still in Sudan. Uh, I was wondering, so do you have more bikes? Like how many motorcycles do you have? And do you have a favorite one or a favorite model that you've been riding and, and why? Um, yeah, actually, I think right now I have uh, four bikes. Uh, I never thought I would have four bikes, you know, <laughs> like, but... Um, um, I have one bike here with me now, which is a Suzuki DR350 from 96. So basically it's the oldest bike I've ever had. Um, uh, my, my first bike, big bike I bought is a BMW 650. Um, and it's in Spain. Um, so I usually use it when I'm in Spain for work or also I go to Morocco. So, you know, I don't have to go that down south. Um, I have a bike in Thailand, a CRF250. Uh, yeah. Know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 and I, I love it. And um, I have like my normal, usual bike is the Yamaha 660 XT, which is now in uh, Sudan. So I wouldn't say I have a favorite bike because, you know, uh, like for example, the Yamaha is a very comfortable bike. It's uh, 
it's got very good speed if you have to really, you know, open the throttle and leave or overtake and all these things. Um, it's even comfortable to travel with another person in the back if I wanted to carry luggage. But I found it very heavy and very tall for me. So with years, I found out that, you know, um, I prefer like lighter bikes. Um, so I would say, uh, you know, anything like 250, 350, I would prefer. And usually I ride dual sport bikes because, you know, you can go on road, you can go off road. Many countries don't have like good conditions. So it gives you again, it comes back to the, you know, to my choice of being independent. Like, and that bike is a tool, you know, to, to go that path. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that makes sense because you travel in lots of different countries as well, so you don't always face the same uh, terrain. And uh, but, but I understand you as well on the light bike because, like, especially when you travel on your own, like you don't know if you drop the bike or if anything happens, you want to be able to manage it uh, yourself. So it's a little bit more comfortable in a way, right? Exactly. Yeah, you feel much safer yeah. and much more independent. Yeah. yeah. So uh, speaking of independence, so you, you were born in Iran, uh, educated in Germany, and you moved to Spain uh, where you established more self yourself when you were, when you were 27 years old. Um, so something that I really enjoy uh, in your traveling insight and you know when I started following you and when we started discussing together and, and having those calls is all your traveling insights and all your traveling insights. I really like the position that you don't hesitate to take, uh, the questions you are asking and always questioning a little bit the status quo and, um, and especially your viewpoint on the status of women and, and being from a um, from uh, Iran yourself. Um, I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit more about that and, and from your travel experiences as well and what you particularly struggle with or has struggled with as, um, as an Iranian woman yourself. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is a very broad question, right? <laughs> but... Um, as you said, you know, I was born in Iran and I was in Iran uh, um, throughout like my teenage years um, till I was 17. Um, and then I, uh, I moved to Germany because basically I had a family in Germany and, you know, I could speak German and all those things. So um, being born in Iran and raised there was an extraordinary opportunity, actually, for me. I mean, it was horrible. <laughs> I wouldn't wish anybody that because it was after the Islamic Revolution. So I was like the first generation going through that. And it was also the imposed war by, um, you know, USA and Russia with Iraq, which was the longest war in the 20th century. So it took eight years of my childhood. And um, so they were like very turbulent times and not precisely easy for people and much less for a child and much less if you're a girl. Um, so, you know, I went to all those horrible Islamic experiments uh, the new regime was doing um, in order to segregate uh, women and men and, you know, um, to uh, impose the very archaic Islamic laws and that kind of stuff. Um, so it wasn't easy and the tradition didn't... Uh, help either much you know to um uh, to smooth the islamic laws because even even you know we have on one hand the religion on the other hand we have like the traditions right and it wasn't easy so basically i i knew that for me the only way to survive and to be able to be myself which i think it's you know it's something we all have to pursue is uh, to live um, so i left for germany which was a great move it gave me obviously a lot of um security you know because i could get myself into real travels if i was you know um, continuing living in iran because of the uh, separation and um, you know the country's laws and all these things like just freedom. for being a woman or because you were like a, uh, you were a more exposed woman or traveling woman or just because you were a woman well it's um being a um, I mean, being a woman is very difficult, but it's just like, you know, it's a dictatorship. It's an Islamic dictatorship. So, um, and it's not just for being a woman or man. It's just like for being who you are and telling your opinion, which, I mean, I notice also in many other countries, you cannot, you really cannot give our opinion. Maybe you sit with your friends and give your opinion, but, you know, um, 
it, it's hard. Like it, that degree of freedom, I don't think it exists anywhere in the world. But obviously in Western society, we have much more freedom um, than we have in some other countries. So I just needed that freedom to, you know, to be myself, uh, basically. But I, I need to say one thing that uh, I also really enjoyed being a woman in Iran because later as a like, you know, fully fledged woman, uh, just speaking about the gender, when I was abroad, I noticed that, you know, I have another kind of self-confidence as a woman, you know, it's, which is very interesting. You wouldn't think of that. You would think, okay, as a woman, you didn't have so many rights, you know, um, the big brother or your dad would rule you. But on the other hand, you were like kind of like the jewel of the family, you know, you were the little princess, you were the treasure. So everybody would look after you. Everybody would protect you, take care of you, you know, your wish would be, <laughs> you know, uh, like on top of the list of uh, any man. Um, and this doesn't happen anymore in the modern society. Like if you come to Europe, if you go to the US, well, you are a man um, and you are a woman, you do the same thing, you carry the same bag of things and no matter if as a woman, you know, you are wicked than a man. <laughs> so I noticed that also that um, gave me much more in, you know, some, somehow I was offered less and I was restricted. All aspect I was receiving a lot, so it's kind of like you know a balance. Yeah, yeah, fair, fair enough. Uh, it's uh, yeah. Sometimes you want to be the both of both. We want to be the best of both worlds, right? <laughs> we want to be uh, with uh, you know we can have it all. I mean, we can be independent and free to be who we are. It doesn't mean that we don't appreciate. Uh, a man or uh, another woman for that matter being carrying and when you're facing a difficulty with your bike or with your bag or anything to to get ahead you know we're all humans so but yeah it's true sometimes I feel that as well that if you're a bit free and independent and a strong woman then people expect that you don't need help at all you know, and you know, you need to fit in a box, you're either male or female, but you know, that's not how it is, right? And um, so, yeah, I'm really glad to, to hear that uh, yeah, in your travel, you have those experience where you also yeah, get, get people who help you and don't assume that just because you're traveling alone, you're, you're you know, you're manly and you don't need anyone, you know, that doesn't exactly. make sense. So, what's your best motorcycle ride uh, memory like? Again, I keep it very broad because I want you to speak about what what touches you, what's important to you. So, I, and I know you must have so many and that sort of questions, but one that comes just on the top of your mind and that, that, that you would like to share with other women riders at least. Yeah, well, um, I, I mean, as you said, I've, I've been on the road, you know, I've been like riding around the world, I don't know, since 2013. And like every day is just like my, my life. So, you know, it's not like that I could take a photo album and say that was the day or that was the trip because it's been just amazing, you know. And there are so many impressions, so many memories, so many people, so many sunsets, so many roads, so many bikes, you know, it's just like uh, um, really um, overwhelming. But I, I mean, maybe, maybe because also, you know, we, we are both interested and concerned about women. So this is, I think, like, you know, my, our main, uh, um, you know, thing that brings us together. So I would say one of the, you know, one of those rides that I would never forget is uh, I was getting divorced and uh, um, I was going to do a trip from Spain to uh, Baikal Lake in Russia. Uh, passing through Kazakhstan and all Central Asian countries. But a friend of mine invited me to Ethiopia. He said, you know, I'm in Ethiopia, come and visit me. And I said, oh, okay, why not? So I shipped the bag. That's a big, uh, <laughs> that's a big uh, how do we say? Yes. Uh, stop over, detour. Right? Detour, that's yes, a big yes. detour. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm perfect for detours, you know. I take the longest detour possible. <laughs> So I shipped the bike to Ethiopia, which was very expensive, very costly, you know, wasn't that easy. But I arrived there. And I started riding, you know, my first day in Ethiopia. And I, I was going like to the city where he was in Northern Ethiopia, close to Eritrea. 
And I was a little bit affected, you know, by, by, you know, my divorce and my personal experience and all the adversity, you know, all the, you know, the negativity that you receive from the other person because you cannot agree. And it was a person that you loved before. So I was, you know, kind of like processing that while I was writing. Ethiopia is one of, I would say, one of the most dangerous countries to write <laughs> because you have anything living on the road you have people kids women all the people cows goats donkeys and it's not like um, india or any other african country i know it's just like ethiopia I, I just found it very very dangerous like and people just don't look when you come on the streets like donkeys the same thing it's just like you know <laughs> each time i was kind of like facing death twice or three times and i wasn't going like more than 90 but 90 is a lot for those roads and for that you know for the traffic on the road but um, at some point I decided to take to do like a three-day off-road uh, um, to the city I was by myself so I was uh, you know I was a little bit hesitant if I can do it by myself if anything happens to me who would help me but I decided to do it it was also good kind of like you know for my ego <laughs> uh, and while I was on that road three days long uh, beautiful scenery, you know, all rural little villages and uh, Ethiopia is like very mountainous. So it was going up and down and having like amazing uh, view over the valleys. But I noticed there are so many women it's always accompanying me on the road, like sharing the same road with me while sitting, you know, as a queen on my bike, you know, with all the gears. And, you know, I'm going through that and I feel... Um, sad and unhappy and these people were like always carrying like 20 liters of water uh, carrying some wood on their back having a kid here and taking another kid on the hands and going up the mountain and it was just day by day like every single minute i was sharing that road with them and i i felt um, very very sad and very affected by that because i was actually one of the luckiest women on earth you know I was doing my trip, I was free, I was happy, I, I was rich, I had a bike, you know, I had, I don't know if you hear me, because I see the connection is a bit unstable. Did you hear me? Yes, yes. So it was cut a little bit when you were starting to talk about the, the woman who was accompanying on the road, and the camera was stopping, but we could still hear the story. So okay. yeah, this woman <laughs> accompanying you along the way, and this kind of yeah. paradox be between your own emotional feelings and you know that there's no right or wrong you, you were you went you went through something difficult you were sad and emotional and at the same time feeling this kind of guilt because like you're free you ride your bike and, and having very difficult physical lives and, and so on. So yeah, that, that's what I got from what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. So that's that really kind of like, you know, left a long lasting scar and memory on me because I mean, it was absolutely gorgeous. The, the, like the landscape I was going through, it was just overpowering. It was amazing. And, um, but it was, it was, it was, I mean, for me, it was kind of like a, like a little cage for these people because they would never, ever get out of it. Like they would be doing the same thing over and over again till they become old and they die. So no freedom, no, no time for them, no appreciation because they are being used by men. And it really doesn't matter if Muslim, Christian, Buddhist is just like, you know, exploitation of a weak gender by traditions, by thousands of years of, so, and I couldn't do anything. So that also felt bad because it was like, okay, uh, you know, I'm just passing through, I'm recording that and I'm going to share it with, the, with, you know, with whoever I talk to, but I wish I could make a change and help. Yes, yes, I totally understand that feeling. And um, again, I think sometimes it's overwhelming because we know we cannot make change uh, alone but I think one together we can and second um, and I think through our discussions that we had before as well all individually we can make differences like by our own small actions and by you know putting value on those women and that's also the concept of of the trip that we want to do is be able to give opportunities and exposure and show the value of those women and the adversity that's going they are going through and inspire them and 
and giving them opportunities as well. Um, so I think, yeah, of course, the change, the world is not going to change from one day to another, but, you know, day after day and action after action, we, we make change. We don't see it happening, but, but it is happening. So, um, yeah. so yeah, I, I really love that story. It's, uh, and I understand, yeah, this kind of double, this kind of double feelings and, and the impact it made to you. I, I had these similar feelings. In my case, it was in Nepal, in Nepal and India that I really encountered that, you know, and being in the mountains and seeing those women and, you know, realizing that, yeah, they, they were not free, but at the same time, they could also be so happy, you know, and, uh, yeah, it's, anyway, it would be a complete uh, discussion by itself. Um, so just to, to, to wrap up, I'd like to go back a little bit to Iran. Uh, because uh, so at the moment, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're working on a on a trip that I'm particularly excited about because um, so for most PW trips, I've been to those countries myself, uh, but Iran never, and that's really. Uh, but I know a lot of Iranian people in Malaysia where I live, and it's always a country that has really attracted me. So, if you could describe riding in Iran in three words or what would this what this bike trip will be about. I think we'll have to do a complete different interview and QA to discuss to discuss about it in particular. But if you could just choose three words to tell us what this bike trip is going to be about in Iran. Sure. Uh, well, Iran is a big country, <laughs> uh, so maybe I, I could use like 20 words, but now that I have this limitation, let me say, I think it's um, unique. The trip is going to be unique. Uh, why? Because we never had a group of women riding in Iran. It has never happened. Um, and it's possible, it's a lot, it's legal, but nobody has ever done it. So this is gonna be kind of like a revolutionary. It's gonna set you know, new examples. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited about it and I'm really passionate about it and I'm proud of it, you know, and of you and this idea. And I really, you know, um, appreciate your idea and your project because this is just gonna be amazing, you know, to, to be the first person to show the way, to open that, you know, to pave the road is important. That. And I think this is what we are doing here. Um, I think it, it, writing in Iran as a woman is going to be also very empowering um, for, for ourselves as women and also for other women and men that see us. It's just not, you know, also men take inspirations on women. I have met so many men that say, my God, I'm not able to do that and I see you doing this. Um, sure. So that's an empowering um, um, experience. And it's not only also because of the fact of man, man or woman or writing, it's also the countryside in Iran, you have like huge deserts, you have like huge mountains, 4,000, 5,000 meters mountains. So, you know, you're geographically also set in the right mindset. So, and I would say it's a very friendly, it's going to be very friendly, very generous experience. So Iran is very friendly. It's uh, the country of hospitality. People are amongst the most hospitable, most you know, welcoming people in the world. Um, and there is nothing more beautiful than giving love and receiving love. And I think this is going to happen in Iran. So um, that makes me, you know, uh, kind of like burst into joy <laughs> because I know it's going to be beautiful. As I know it's going to set a new uh, trend. Um, and I know that it's going to be very nice for, you know, anybody involved. Lovely. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And yeah, I know. As I told you, I have a few Iranian friends here and they always tell me, yeah, you know, you know, man, that, that's really cool, but there's also something very annoying. They can never say no. You know, they always invite you in their home and you cannot say no. And I'm like, that's pretty cool. It's like, yeah, but it's really, really typical. So, yeah, so unique, empowering, and friendly. Yes, I would say that. <laughs> Sounds really good. Sounds really good. Well, so, yeah, I can't wait to, to share a bit more about that trip and to invite other women to chat with you soon to have a bit more, like, information and answer any questions they have. Um, so until then, um, I'll let you uh, get back to your daily life and uh, 
enjoy Bulgaria. Thank you so much again for your time. It was great catching up as usual. And yeah, we'll talk soon anyway. So yeah. have a great thank you so much. In front of you. Yeah, thank you too. I mean, honestly, for, for your great idea, for, you know, <laughs> and for putting up with my changing schedule. Uh, this is just being on the road. So lovely to see you. <laughs> Have a great weekend and we hopefully make something very nice and powerful happen. Great. See you soon, Masa. <laughs> Bye. Ciao. 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 Bye.